Hello, my name is Jan Semenza and I'm recording this from Stockholm, Sweden. Today we'd like to talk about climate change and the impact on infectious diseases and specifically I would like to talk about cascading risk pathways and waterborne diseases. And if we think about climate change, we all know that there are lots of manifestations of climate change today. <clears throat> we see severe weather, we see um, um, extreme heat, sea level rise and so on. But um, I don't want to touch on all of these, obviously, and sp focus specifically on waterborne uh, diseases. And so what are the implications when it comes to water contamination, water quality? What does that mean for public health? But most importantly, I would like to ask the question, what does it mean from an adaptation perspective? Is it possible to prevent these kind of impacts from climate change on waterborne diseases specifically. And so the way I would like to look at this is using this framework of cascading risk pathways. And what I mean by that is that if you have an extreme rain event, as an example, and that can potentially trigger a sequence of secondary events that are causally connected to that initial event. And then these cascading risk pathways can then result in large scale waterborne outbreaks. And this concept can apply, be applied to a lot of other outcomes in, in public health. But let's focus on waterborne diseases as an example. And then you see uh, what I mean. Just illustrating specifically what I had in mind was you take a, a rain event as an extreme event, uh, extreme uh, precipitation event, which leads to storm runoff. And that runoff leads to the fact that pathogens are mobilized in pastures and flushed into the, into waterways where they can potentially infiltrate the water intake of a water uh, treatment plant, potentially overwhelm the, the water treatment system and lead to waterborne outbreaks. And let me illustrate this on this particular illustration on this graph on this slide here. So here at the very center of the graph, you have a metropolitan area, a big city. And, and in the left top corner, you have an extreme precipitation event up in the foothills of this metropolitan area where the water um, uh, from this runoff, from, from this rain event leads to runoff that carries with it pathogens from wild animals or domestic animals into the waterways. And from the stream, it enters the water intake for the water treatment plant, where pathogens such as Cryptosuperidium or Gerardia can potentially survive the chlorination process and the treatment process, and then enter the water distribution system in, in the city that then leads to massive waterborne outbreaks. It turns out that there is some epidemiologic evidence for that. So we looked at waterborne outbreaks in Scandinavia. See, so we're looking at Denmark, Finland, Norway, and Sweden in the northern part of Scandinavia, in the northern part of Europe. And you can see that these water outbreaks now are illustrated as these blue dots in proportion to the number of cases that occurred as part of the, these um, um, outbreaks. And so we analyzed all these outbreaks uh, for um, these years. Here you can see two quarters out of throughout the year. And we set up a case control study, a matched case control study, where we linked the epidemiologic uh, data with meteorologic conditions that we collected from the central weather stations or created precipitation data for a specific location where that outbreak occurred. And we compare that to non-outbreak sites with the precipitation area uh, precipitation data from that non-outbreak site. And having this kind of a matched case control study, we were able to analyze these extreme precipitation events that we defined as the 95 percentile of precipitation for that location. For every single location, we took the extreme, the statistical extreme for that location and compared that to these outbreaks. And we, we analyzed the data. We did in fact see a threefold increased risk for a waterborne outbreak if it was preceded by an extreme precipitation event um, um, two weeks um, um, or one week earlier um, before that, that outbreak. So there was an epidemiologic link 
And probably due to this cascading pathway of different events that happen as a result of that extreme precipitation event. Another example will be a heavy rain event that leads to flooding. And then that flooding damages critical infrastructure like um, a well, for example, that then in, its, in turn leads to waterborne outbreak. And again, this is illustrated on this graph here that you can see in the in the bottom corner of the graph here in the left corner you can see this uh, well that has been inundated by the flooding event due to the rain and then that damages the water intake for the single um, household water supply and again you can show we can show this epidemiologically that there was an almost ninefold increased likelihood of having a waterborne outbreak if it was preceded by this extreme precipitation event so there is some epidemiologic evidence that these extreme events cause um, waterborne outbreaks in, in, in Scandinavia. We can expand the concept of waterborne diseases to vectorborne diseases even because, as you know, mosquitoes require water as part of their life cycle, right? The, hatch, the eggs are laid in water, they have to hatch in water. Um, so standing water is required for mosquitoes uh, as part of their life cycle. And if we think that a hurricane, for example, can disrupt critical infrastructure and leads to a breakdown of vector control measures, then that in turn can lead to, to vector-borne disease outbreak, which has been observed for dengue or chingunya in, in, in the Caribbean or in Latin America. So we know that this is a phenomenon that has been observed as well. And you can read about these type of outbreaks in this particular paper here listed at the bottom of the slide. So the question then is, what can we do with, about these potential outbreaks and the consequences of, of um, these cascading events to, for public health? Is it possible to design early warning systems that can potentially prevent these uh, events from happening in the first place? And let's imagine climate change has an impact on, on the environment that I mentioned earlier on the first slide that leads them to direct, direct exposures like heat waves and drowning and things like that, but also indirect exposures and those economic in, impacts that have all their health outcomes that we measure in public health with our surveillance systems, right? That's what we do traditionally in public health. However, if you want to act, it's too late because these cases have occurred already. So the question is, can we build a system where we monitor these um, epidemic precursors before we have these um, outcomes in public health. Is it possible to monitor climatic or environmental precursors of disease before they, they result in disease? And that's what we built at the European Centers for Disease Fresh Control as part of the European Environment and Epidemiology Network, the E3 network, where we monitor these climatic and environmental precursors of disease upstream before they have an impact on public health. And this is the concept, we're all familiar with these type of epidemiologic curves today as part of the COVID pandemic. You have all seen these, uh, these curves. And the question is, can we potentially monitor environmental or climatic signals before we have a public health impact? And this is exactly what we did um, as part of um, the system where we try to monitor environmental signals in order to initiate active surveillance so we can initiate uh, case finding and initiate our response in order to suppress that curve, curve and reduce the public health burden um, overall. So that's the, the concept. And when we analyzed the diseases that um, are of concern in uh, Europe, we mapped them according to their link to climate change. So we grouped them into uh, they are strongly associated with climate or climate change, medium, uh, the, the association wasn't that convincing, or not so much um, associated with climatic events in Europe. So this applies for European infectious diseases. And then we asked ourselves, well, now we found diseases that are strongly associated with climate change. Does that mean we need to take public health action? And we decided that not necessarily, just because it's a strongly associated with climate change doesn't mean that we in public health need to take public health action because 
if the disease burden for this particular disease isn't very big, then that doesn't mean that we need to do anything about it, right? So we mapped it against the impact on society, against mortality, morbidity, and disease burden. And this is what is a risk weighted risk analysis is all about, to weigh the combination of climate change against the impact on society. And that's how we came up with this matrix. And then we analyzed the surveillance systems in Europe and the, 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 um, what, how adequate the disease burden could um, be captured by those surveillance systems in Europe. And you can see that the diseases that are now highlighted in bold in this weighted risk analysis, you can see that Lyme borreliosis, for example, is strongly associated with climate change, but the disease burden um, was of concern also, but that the, the surveillance system wasn't adequate. And so after this paper was published, Lyme borreliosis was put under surveillance, very similar to TBE, tick-borne encephalitis is now under surveillance also, after this paper had been published. And a number of other diseases were of concern also, like dengue, rift valley fever, chikungunya, visual leishmaniasis or vibrio infections. And it turns out that these vibrio infections are still not under surveillance on the, Nash, on, on the international scale or a continent wide scale in Europe, uh, as opposed to the United States. So we were concerned about the fact that these uh, bacteria are potentially dangerous and of concern to public health, but there is no surveillance system. So the question is, can we build an early warning system by monitoring the climatic or environmental suitability for these vibrio infections and then take public health action as a result? And the concept was this one here, where we would merge epidemiologic data that's available on a national level with environmental and climatic data integrate that data system, analyze them, interpret them in order to take the public health action. And this is what we um, looked at. We looked at the Baltic Sea, for example, where we would monitor the sea surface temperature and salinity in the Baltic. And this tool that we built is applicable to anywhere in the world. But let's focus in on Baltic, of the Baltic for now. And this tool that works on a global scale is called the Vibrio Map Viewer that's visible here on the E3 Geo portal of the European Environmental Epidemiology Network. And you can see the Vibrio Map Viewer in the top right corner. And this is of concern because these bacteria, they start growing once it gets warmer. So there's a very strong climate change link with these type of marine bacteria as illustrated in this environmental hub paper because if people if it gets warm people go to the beach and that's where the exposure happened that's exactly the same time when these bacteria start to propagate once the sea surface temperature is, uh, is surpassed uh, once 15 degrees or so as a threshold is surpassed so if, we, if it reaches 16 17 18 degrees these bacteria start to grow and they love uh, warm water with low salinity so they thrive in brackish water and this is when these bacteria can potentially infect uh, um, individuals that uh, hang out at the beach and we can see wound infections gastroenteritis and septicemia as a result and they're very dangerous bacteria that uh, have a case fatality rate for the septicemia that's very similar to, uh, uh, to um, Ebola infections with a case fatality of up to 50 percent. So these infections are very dangerous. They can lead to um, uh, amputations or deaths and that's why there are so much of concern in public health and we see these type of deaths occur uh, during hot summer months in, in Sweden uh, as well. So we basically sent, set up an early warning system now for these type of, of uh, infections. I monitor the sea surface temperature and salinity remotely using uh, NASA data, remotely sent sea surface temperature and salinity data, and we computed the environmental suitability for these type of vibrio infections um, worldwide, but specifically calibrated for the, the, the Baltic that would indicate that an area is at high risk. For example, here in 2014, we saw that the Baltic was heating up and we were concerned about potential vibrio infections based on these climatic environmental signal that we detected through the vibrio map viewer in 2014 using the forecast that was available on this platform. When we then compare this environmental signal with the epidemiologic data that was collected by the government of Sweden. So these are national data, not continent-wide data, national data for Sweden. We did see a spike in cases 
um, illustrated on this slide here for 2014. And you see the exposure response relationship that we computed when we related sea surface temperature with the risk for these type of infections in Sweden. So there is this exponential curve uh, with increased uh, cases. Once we knew that this system worked, we wrote up reports in the Communicable Disease Threat Report that's produced by ECDC on, um, on a weekly basis during the hot summer months, so hot summer months um, in, um, in, in Europe. And we alerted the state epidemiologists um, in, in the Baltic states um, um, that a certain bay, for example, the Bay of Riga, is at increased risk for these type of infections based on environmental suitability, based on our early warning system, and that they should consider beach closures, alert to the public, and alert to the healthcare providers that they should watch out for these type of infections and alert immunocompromised individuals not to go to the beach um, and, and be aware of recreational water use if they have a wound that could put them at risk for a potential infection. So this is an early warning system that's up and running that has been operationalized in Europe to prevent these type of infections that are associated with climate change due to the warming of the sea surface temperature. So in conclusion, we believe that um, society is potentially at risk from these cascading risk pathways that I illustrated um, earlier and due to these inherent societal vulnerabilities um, and that a narrow siloed or linear assessment of these potential risks can potentially misinform policymakers and, and increase the risk for public health in general, unless we take an, uh, a more holistic view of these type of impacts by taking the interconnected nature of our society today into account, where we consider social demographic and environmental drivers of infectious diseases, and then stimulate the better collaboration between public health practitioners and climate scientists, epidemiologists, civil engineers, social scientists, and so on, to come up with uh, uh, solutions that are appropriate for this complex issue of climate change and the impacts on public health. Only by uh, um, and building on research and improving our health systems, can we build resilient societies and engage the communities and community-based participants in research to engage them in these kind of early warning systems so they feel ownership of these kind of early warning systems in order to prevent a sicker future as a result of, of climate change. And the way we want to think about that is to, we need to consider the hazard when it comes to climate change, but also the vulnerabilities in society and the exposure patterns. And only if we take those three cogs of the wheel into account, can we reduce the climate change risks in the future by targeting hazards through mitigation and adaptation, reducing vulnerability and exposure and having an impact on population and health. In general, I'd like to thank the, the uh, all individuals that are involved in this work, the work that was done for the weighted risk analysis, the Vibrio work, and the waterborne outbreaks. And if you have any questions, please let me know. Um, here is my email. Um, and again, consider the cascading risk pathways for waterborne diseases, but other infectious diseases or other health endpoints um, from climate change, if you would like to intervene. Um, on these threats to public health in the most comprehensive way. And thanks for your attention. And here, here again is my email. Thank you.